And we're here today talking with uh, David Martz, who uh, left from Brentwood in what year, David? Well, I retired five years ago, John. And that uh, doesn't seem that long. No, it goes, it goes very be, fast. Yeah, it would be June of 61. June of 61, and at that time you, uh, you were the high school principal. You were Brentwood High School principal at that time. Well, Carmen Puglio had the title of high school principal. I was principal of Rossville and associate for high school. Okay. Um, since you've retired, uh, you've had a chance to reflect over the years that you served as a teacher and uh, then as an administrator in the district as, as well as an active uh, president of the, of the union and of the association. What was memorable for you about the early days when you first arrived? Why don't you talk a little bit about when you first came to Brentwood and what you remember about that? Well, of course, Brentwood's quite different in those days, John. I came up here in uh, 1961. And uh, Brentwood was a growing school district. And it was the time of, I guess, the big expansion on Long Island. And Brentwood was uh, one of the areas that was rapidly expanding as a school district. They couldn't build schools fast enough. Uh, hiring teachers was a very difficult thing. Uh, they sent recruiters up upstate New York to all the colleges. They, they sent recruiters to into other states. They advertised in other states. Um, Ross Building was just a new open high school of, I think, 1958 when they opened the, the Ross Building. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years after my arrival here, we were on split session. And then another couple of years later, they built Sonderling Building. And it wasn't long again that you're on split session. So Brentwood went through uh, some very severe growing pains. And we had a, uh, a lot of trouble recruiting and holding on to teachers in those days. Salaries weren't uh, that high. Um, there was demand for teachers in other throughout words, the state. What, you, what you're saying, I, I seem to recall, people would come, they would work for a number of years here, and then they would leave for other patches. They would kind of cut their teeth in the classroom of Brentwood and leave in the early stages. I remember that was the case when I first arrived. In the early days, we had uh, we had a high turnover of teachers, and uh, teachers would move for, uh, say, four or $500 better salary in another mm -hmm. district. Yes. And that's the kind of competition that got in. This is also about the same time when uh, other districts were starting to grow yeah. on, the, on the island. And it was also a time in which uh, teachers started to, in a sense, organize and, and wanted to have a voice in their, uh, in their profession. They wanted to become professionals. And they, uh, the union movement started uh, in the city back in those mm -hmm. days, in the 60s mm -hmm. and early 60s. Of course, the state organizations uh, were uh, not union in those days. New York State Teachers Association. So it, it was different times. Very exciting times, though. I'll, yeah. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you first arrived, then you arrived a couple of years before I did. Brentwood had already been growing since uh, what the fifties, would you say, the, the the end of World War II, and then. But the real growth spurt occurred, such as you've described up in the... Well, in the mid-50s, I would say, uh, is when the district started to change because then they, uh, they had to build the high school. Russ was the Brentwood High School that at that time. And it was named after a long-standing president of the Board of Education by the name of Dr. Ross. And uh, in those days, the district was under a district principalship, uh -huh. not its own superintendency. Uh -huh. you know, that's the way they were organized. And the district principal was responsible for the superintendent at, uh, at the BOCES unit. It wasn't until a few years later, in the mid-60s, when uh, Lou Danini became district principal. And then he moved to have the board uh, uh, petition the state to become the Brentwood 
school district under its own superintendent. He became the first superintendent of schools. Now, how did you happen to come to Brentwood? How did you, because you're not native to this part of the world. You, no, that's true. <clears throat> I was born and raised in Western Maryland, in the mountains, so to speak, although uh, my hometown wasn't in the mountains itself. Uh, Cumberland, Maryland, which has some historical significance, you being a history teacher. Yes. <laughs> uh, George Washington built Fort Cumberland on his way with uh, Braddock on their way to uh, Pittsburgh in the American French and Indian War. And uh, it was a rather historical town in that sense. But in any case, I got to Brentwood, went, went to school in West Virginia, did my, both my undergraduate and graduate work in West Virginia. And I met a lot of New Yorkers, my fraternity brothers that, that I was very close to. Two of them lived in New York. My roommate was a fellow from Queens, a basketball player from Queens, by the way, all city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had interviewed in Maryland and Delaware. And then when I was up here visiting a friend, I uh, so while I'm here, uh, let me pick up a few interviews in the New York area. And I interviewed in Merrick. And uh, a fellow connected me with uh, uh, the principal of Brentwood High School by the name of Fred Weaver. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in August of August of '61, and I came out and uh, had an interview with Mr. Weaver and his assistant uh, uh, at that time was Beryl Knott. Yes. And uh, that day, after a tour of the school and after we'd spent oh about an hour and a half with each other, uh, Fred called me in the office and offered me a contract which I wasn't prepared at that time. I mean, this is how quickly mm -hmm. they moved when they found a candidate mm -hmm. that, uh, that they wanted. I was a science teacher, and there was high demand for all teachers. Science and mathematics were kind of uh, in a higher demand. And um, I told Mr. Weaver, I said, I'll have to confer with my wife and I'll get back to you. He says, well, I'm going on vacation up in Maine. Here's my <laughs> yeah. telephone number. Right. I, I went back to West Virginia, talked with my wife, called him on the phone after he came in from fishing in the evening at 630 and told him I accepted the contract that was in the mail. And Done. the rest is history. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I really have enjoyed Long Island and, and in Brentwood with the people that I've met through the years and how it's grown and how it's changed. T tell me something. Uh, is there anything that you remember about the interview process itself that stands out in your mind when Fred interviewed you for the job? Was there something about that interview that you that not, has stayed with you? Not the interview itself. Okay. But at some point in time when we were finished with the interview, uh, Mr. Weaver and Mrs. Knott wanted to talk. And so they sent me on a tour through the building mm -hmm. and I ran across this fellow coming down the hall. He had this big key ring on his uh, belt. I thought was the head custodian, big beard, right? And kind of a grumpy, grouchy kind of guy, but a very friendly fellow, you know. <laughs> Reggie Poquette, yes. the chairman of the Industrial Arts Department. He was one of the first people that I met. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. Of course, I never let him forget the fact that I thought he was the custodian of the Department of Industrial Arts. <laughs> and he, uh, that always stood out in my mind. And the other thing was that, uh, uh, that they offered, and that was very common, to offer a contract right after an interview with mm -hmm. an individual yes, that they, yeah. they wanted to hang on to. And um, that, that I found surprising because the other districts that I interviewed in, they usually, they'd indicate, of course, that they were interested, but they, they would follow up with an offer in a day or so or something like that. There are so many things that I would love to ask right now, but I, asking them one at a time, you, you mentioned Reggie Poquette, and I was laughing because I remember him as a marvelous human being and a wonderful character. There were other characters that we have met along the way. Um, that have left their own particular mark from those days, from those early days. Oh, yeah. Uh, is there anyone else who comes to mind that you can think of from those initial days? Oh, I guess there, there were plenty, John. Yeah, I you know. know. <laughs> to single one out is a tough, is tough. I realize that. When you first became a science teacher then and you took the contract and you began to work, um, 
On the one hand, I want to ask how long it was before you became active in the organization. And on the other hand, I want to ask if there were programs that you particularly were uh, enthusiastic about that had to do with students that you work with at, in the initial, you know, in your initial years. Do you remember working with students in, in any capacity? Um, well, actually, John. Uh, outside the classroom, I'm talking about. No, no, I understand that. I'd have to say that. Um, and when I first came, of course, you're in your first year, you're a green teacher. Yes. Um, and you're, you're you're kind of breaking, being broken in. You're feeling your way along. You're trying new techniques. Uh, it was the first experience I had working with high school youngsters. Although I did have some teaching experience uh, from college, because I did uh, uh, teach genetic lab for mm -hmm. my uh, college advisor when I was in a graduate program. But uh, that's a different kind of a situation. Yes. Uh, so I was pretty much, I'd say, the first two years uh, honing my skills. Of course, that never stopped. Of course, uh, as you know, it doesn't with us in this business. And I got involved with uh, with the teacher uh, organizations back. I'd say around about in the in the third year, mm -hmm. second or third year. Charlie Gray, that's a name from the yes, past. That's right. Uh, was president of the organization, and. Uh, Teachers were starting to uh, to organize themselves and, and wanted a voice in, in, in their destiny, mm -hmm. and they wanted to work with management. In those days, the Teachers Association, the Brentwood Teachers Association, and they were associations, they were non-union, mm -hmm. uh, had representatives of the different buildings throughout the district, and they also had administrative representatives. There was a central uh -huh. administrative representative in the House of Delegates, which was your legislative branch of your teacher's organization. Uh, the assistant superintendent of schools, a fellow by the name of uh, Lee P. Stewart, mm -hmm. was the uh, central representative, and he was the assistant to the district principal, which we think of in terms of the superintendent, superintendent. which was Gene Hoyt. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, the negotiation process for teachers' contracts and fringe benefits and those kinds of things uh, although they talked with the teachers, that really wasn't uh, the same kind of a bargaining process uh, that you have nowadays uh, under the Public Employees Relations Act, which created and mandated that boards recognize representatives of, of the uh, employee staffs, the teaching staff in this case, and that they bargain with them and enter into written agreements. And Luckily, I guess, in an excitement sense, I, I was part of that change that took place. Now, Charlie Gray, I think, was uh, the first uh, president of the Teachers Association that started to organize it, and he rented out some office space and had an office, and uh, that was the start of that kind of an organization, and that got followed up and, and developed. Uh, as time went on, in 1960, 1965, I, I, mm -hmm. I believe, 64, 65, Bob Farina was president, and by this time I had been a delegate at the high school, and I was elected uh, as the vice president of mm -hmm. the uh, Brentwood Teachers Association. And we expanded our office, we hired a secretary, and we started to organize ourselves to communicate with the teachers. We were <clears throat> we uh, developed a, uh, a team of representatives to bargain with the, uh, the Board of Education. And uh, even though were we you part have, of the transition from professional organization to uh, teachers union? Were you part of that? Well, I'd say I was part of the movement towards that. Towards end. that. Yeah. All right. And there were two there was levels. a lot of resistance. There were, oh, yeah, the there's beginning. two levels of things that were going on at the same time. There were, there was the movement on the local level mm -hmm. and the changes that were taking yes. place. And, of course, this was in pretty much in sync with which what was going on throughout not only Long Island, the state of New York was changing. Yes. And uh, New York City um, had become union under Al Shanker in those mm -hmm. days. And the first large school district, which wasn't union at the time, was the uh, Rochester's Teachers Association. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, 
their president, I'm trying to think of his name, um, of the Buffalo's Teachers Association, became the first president of the union when it when it became a union. But we elected him first to um, Harry Holbart comes. Is that name? Okay. I, I wish I could help you. I, can't I think it was Harry Holbart okay. uh -huh. uh, from Allen Rochester. In those days, each district. Now, is it Tom Hobart? You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not thinking of Tom Hobart. Who's Tom? Who, who Tom Hobart is still very, uh, very much involved with the New York State Teachers Association. Well, it might have been Tom. Okay. okay. Hobart okay. comes to mind. Okay. Yes. Sorry about the lapse no, in the history no. here. <clears throat> Al Shanker, of course, uh, moved in and became his vice president when mm -hmm. they, when they became uh, the New York State Teachers yes. Union. Yes. But before that, they were the association, NYSTA, instead of NYSUT. And uh, each school district had representatives to the New York State Teachers Association. Brentwood uh, had grown so rapidly, we were the biggest on Long Island. We had more staff and more kids, yes. and we were the largest, fastest growing school district in and, those days. It, at some point, Dave, wasn't it true that during the mid-60s, I guess, we were also uh, probably the, the sixth largest school district in the state. We were, oh, yeah. uh, we were that big. Yeah, outside of, let's say, the urban school districts, mm -hmm. we were the largest. I remember 23,000 students as a number. I, I think we think. peaked around that yeah. Yeah. in 12 square miles. Though. Wow. You know? wow. And it's going back up. Yeah. Yes, sir. But in any case, in, in that time period, the uh, representation to the New York State Teachers Association was based upon the number of members that mm -hmm. you had. And of course, uh, it was almost understood everyone belonged to the New York State Teachers Association. There was yeah. pressure from administration oh. to belong to it. They belonged to it. You see? See. Oh. This was an organization oh. of teachers and administrators together. And that was part of the problem that went on on the local level, uh -huh. too, which I'll get yes. to in a yes. minute. The exciting part was that uh, we had the largest number of delegates. Therefore, we were a commanding force mm -hmm. on the state level when we went to conventions. Mm -hmm. And we organized ourselves with, uh, in conjunction with districts like West Islip and Mount Sayville and in the area mm -hmm. here. But I remember West Islip particularly. And... On that basis, we were able to, to be an influence in who would get elected, not only to uh, the New York State Teachers Association, but who would get elected to uh, as a representative to NEA. Mm -hmm. And we were also delegates to the New York State uh, Retire Peter Teachers Ryan, Retirement please, System. Office, and in those days, the organization and the retirement system were dominated by administration. Uh -huh. And... That, that was not right, yes. and we felt that. Yes. So we moved in conjunction with others to get this young, bright Hobart in as our president, mm -hmm. and we also moved to get some representatives on the New York State Retirement uh, Organization, the retirement system, had teacher representatives. And through the influence of Brentwood and our colleagues in the surrounding districts, we were able to get Nick Milletta elected Yes. as the director of the teacher's retirement system, which greatly enhanced what then developed in terms of better representation for the teacher's interest, better representation for the uh, uh, investments that they were making, right. that kind of a right. thing. So there's two things that went on, uh, actually three, a change in the board of directors at the uh, level for the, mm -hmm. for the retirement system, uh, we changed the, the type and the nature of the New York State Teachers Association, which then led to it was Hobart that got together with Al Shanker and then brought it about a union yes. in that place. And on the local level, uh, the teachers then were, were able to get some voice and organize themselves and get representation that became effective. We went through a period of time, and I would say the biggest changes took place in the 60s, uh, under the organization of Bob Farina as president, and then the, the, the next two years uh, under myself, and sometimes things are a matter of being in the right place at the exactly. right time. Sure. And in 1967-68, uh, the uh, 
New York State Legislature passed law, uh, the Public Relation, Employees Relations Act, and created uh, the PERB uh, Board, the Public Relations Employees Relations Board, that would be in, uh, mandated that school districts negotiate with teachers and enter into written contracts. And it was 1968 that was the first year of that. So when I was president in 68, we entered into the first contract with the Board of ah, Education. So there's it was a, written. a watershed year. And uh, oh, it was, it was uh, I thought, a very significant you contract. At the same time, the organization was changing because uh, we moved under the, uh, the relationships in, under the PERB Act to move administration out of oh, no. yes. the local teachers organization and, and out of the state organization eventually, but BTA first. And uh, to be honest with you, I was very instrumental in, in rewriting the constitution of the BTA that eliminated uh, administrators from the organization from the department head up. Anyone who was in uh, a position of evaluation we felt did not belong as a representative of the teachers and in that organization. And uh, there was a, a great support for that movement at that time. And I think one of, the, one of the reasons for these this interview and this series of interviews is to make sure that incidents like this and the steps like this are not lost on the current, uh, on current uh, people who are in the classroom or in education. Because, uh, as, as I've said many times before, anyone teaching today is standing on the shoulders of people who have come before that have accomplished various things along the line. And um, the relating of that is, is very, very important to not alone not to lose what has been gained so far, but also to, uh, to provide a, um, almost a, a, a legacy of, uh, of good works, etc. Uh, something you mentioned earlier also comes to mind. That is, you said it took about three years before you really engaged and became involved in the organization itself. And I'm glad you said that because there are young people who are teaching today who are also uh, under the gun the first couple of years of teaching. They're, they're, they're working very hard to complete their education. They're active with students in it. And uh, when people look to say, gee, how come the new teachers are not getting involved in the union? This may be part of the reason right away that there is uh, that there is uh, a need for a cushion of time to develop your your pinnings, your your uh, your underpinnings before you can move and launch yourself into that that part of it. But uh, what have you been doing in the intervening years since since you left um, since you left school? What are you doing with your time? I know you hunt. <laughs> I know that. I know you enjoy the hunt. Uh, you know, when you retire, people ask us, what do you do to fill your time? What do you do? You know, of course, I can turn that question and ask you that because we're course. both retired. Oh, sure. Now. And I think part of the answer that we all know is that we pretty much can do what we want. Yeah. Of course, there's constraints on that. Of course. There always is, though. There uh, always is. Financial and other kinds you of family you. ties and that. But the nice part about being retired is that, uh, you, you, you know, you don't have the pressures and you can kind of sit back and enjoy the, the grandchildren. I'm, I'm blessed to have uh, four grandchildren. Great. My daughter, my oldest girl, uh, lives close by in Islip. Uh, you're and, lucky. Uh, man. I have uh, two great. lovely granddaughters and a grandson. Matter of fact, that they're spending the sleepover at our house tonight. Oh, great, great. So I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, my wife and I being involved there. We travel to Maryland. Uh, we both play golf. I hunt and I fish, and I enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I've been involved in some business operations in, in Maryland, but uh, they've been minor. We own some property down there that mm -hmm. uh, my brother and sister and I inherited. And, and I had, was involved in a timbering operation last year, which was uh, necessary due to uh, gypsy moth oh. damage. Oh, oh dear. We lost maybe six out of ten trees in an oak forest. We only had 20 acres oh. of land, but uh, still, it was it was uh, time consuming to get to get a lumber operation going. Mm -hmm. So I've been busy in that yeah. respect, and, but professionally, I'd have to say that it, you know that I uh, I kind of dropped out in that sense. I, 
I haven't been involved with uh, retirement organizations. This, this right may sound like a bizarre question because you've already answered it in part when you said uh, uh, you didn't miss, I, I forgot how you worded it, but I think you said you didn't miss the stress or, or you, you said something about you didn't, there was something you didn't miss. Is there anything that you do miss? Having oh, sure. What, is, sure. What, do you, what do you miss? Well, you know, you miss the contact with okay. your colleagues. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you miss being involved in, what, which I think is, you know, a very important and exciting profession to be a teacher. And when I say a teacher, you know, there's a, the role over that, and administrator and teachers, because we've come a long way in terms of uh, the history of the uh, of teachers and administrators from a paternalistic yes. uh, situation to where we unionized and then uh, became, in a sense, uh, responsible a great deal for our own destiny. We went through a period of, uh, whether well, there was polarization between administration and teachers uh, to a situation now where I think there's more cooperation between administration and, and teachers working together to yeah, bring I'm about glad you the mentioned kinds that. of That's, things that, yeah. they, mm -hmm. that they want to bring about. Now that we had to go through that that, that phase of, of almost being enemies, and not where all we districts, fought over little things. Not all districts weathered that in the same way that Brentwood has weathered that. Over well, I think Brentwood has been very fortunate yeah. in that sense. I mean, we went through some some tough times. I think yeah, uh, in, until that process came mm -hmm. together, and they saw that they had to work together. And of course, we've been very fortunate in Brentwood that we've had some good people in the union positions and yes. good people in the. Uh, Administrative positions, you know, uh, and this is, I think, common in a lot of the other uh, evolution of other districts too. A lot of your union people uh, moved into administration, not so much that they were, they wanted to be administrators, but the 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 growth was there, the openings were there, and districts went and tapped their talent. Sure. And some of that talent were the very same people that were or, uh, involved in the sure. organization of the teachers association and unions. They were the leadership people. And they were people that caught the eye of the central administration and the board of education. They say, and some of those people then got involved, like myself, in, uh, in administration. In 1968, as I mentioned earlier, when, when uh, we had our first written contract and we reorganized BTA and, and, and had the adoption of a new constitution, uh, of, of which I'd have to say that primarily I had authored. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote myself out of the very organization that I was president of because uh, effective in July, uh, I was going to become a line administrator called Department of Science. And we had made that decision that department heads up didn't belong in the teachers association, that they should be in an administrative association. So two things happened there. The administrator split out of BTA constitutionally. We could say uh, they then had to organize themselves. And so the Brentwood Principals Organization uh, came about where before it had been principals, it became uh, an organization of Brentwood administrators, department heads and coordinators through your assistant principals and principals and your central administrators. Uh, not including the superintendent of schools, but he was on his own under the contract. That all took place in that period, that time period in 1968. So uh, there was a lot of changes then that took place as a result of that. I was going to ask you, because you've occupied, uh, you've worn two hats, so to speak, you've, you've experienced what it's been to be in the classroom. You've also been a key player in, in both the the teacher organization, well, uh, the teacher organization that uh, led to um, the formation of the Union in Brentwood, and you've also occupied an administrative role and worn that hat. You've had to make an awful lot of difficult decisions along the line in all capacities, in all roles. There's a particular decision that you had to make that was difficult beyond all the others come to mind some decision in, in any of those arenas that you had to make and made it. Can you think of anything in particular? John, I think a couple things stand out in, our, in, in my mind. I'm, I'm sure they do, and probably some of my sure. colleagues that were with me at the time. Uh, when 
when we were becoming very active in the teachers organization and changing uh, the type of organization that it was, this paternalistic dominated mm. by administration organization into a teacher oriented organization controlled and run by them. Uh, there were decisions that a few of us had to make that in a sense we, we were putting our jobs on the line. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult. Uh, back in 60, 66, 67, no, year before that, okay. 65, 66, Bob Farina was uh, uh, involved. No, it was the year after that, I was right. Uh, mm -hmm. We had reached a point with the Board of Education, it was the year before the Taylor Law, so it was the 66, 67. I was president of the uh, Teachers Association and we were trying to negotiate with the Board of Education. Uh, we had a negotiating team. And let me throw some names out mm -hmm. here because I think they're, they're part of yes. an important sure. part of history. Exactly. Uh, the negotiating team consisted of myself and Bob Farina and a fellow by the name of uh, Guy DiPietro who went on to become superintendent of schools here mm -hmm. in Brentwood. And um, a fellow by the name of Sam Weitzman was an elementary teacher and, and an old uh, union pro guy from out of New York City, a wonderful man, Sam was. Uh, we would call ourselves the, the Four Horsemen. Um, and we were involved with the board and we reached some controversy over how we were to uh, interpret this closing of school on snow days. Yeah. And the board became arbitrary and capricious. And so we went out on a campaign to change that. And uh, as a result, we called for the first strike and that was uh, something that stands out in my mind because you had to put yourself on the line there yes. and the people that were involved with it. Yes. And the support that we got from the teachers, representatives of the schools, then the schools voted overwhelmingly. We were not coming back to work on the Monday after Easter uh, because that was the day we were supposed to get off and the board so, well, you're going to work that day because of a snow day rather than another day that all the teachers wanted in May sometime. And we decided that's the way it was going to be. And the Saturday, which would be Easter Saturday, Lou Nanini called me on the phone and I hooked up a conference call with Bob Freeney in Pennsylvania and Marion Gray and uh, my vice president, Joe Gerbino from Mount South Junior High right. School, Sam Weitzman, and Guy. And we decided, well, yes, we will talk with the Board of Education. And that Saturday, we met up in North Brentwood in the basement of Irv Keller, who was president of the board, and hammered out an agreement. And then we spent the next 24 to 48 hours calling teachers, trying to get them back to work on Monday. Mm -hmm. And they, we had a written agreement, first written agreement, by the way, between Brentwood Teachers yes. Association and the Board of Education. Yes indicating there'd be no reprisals if the teachers that we couldn't Rich, yes. communicate with and didn't show up on Monday, that they wouldn't get docked, wow. right? There'd be no reprisals. Yes. And we got something like 98% of our people or 99% of our people back in here on Monday. It was beautiful cooperation Wonderful. and support from the teachers. It's just, just a great thing to say. And then of course the following year we negotiated under the Taylor Law and yeah, I think it was one of the nicest contracts in the area. It was uh, used as a model for a long time. And it was modeled after the Rochester's Teachers Association mm -hmm. guidelines by Annie A. And we had a lot of good support from a lot of people in those days. But we built, as you said before, we built on, on what came before us, on Charlie Gray opening up the office, on Bob Farina organizing the delegates throughout the district. Uh, uh, on good negotiators. Sure, I, I can remember when the uh, the president of the uh, of the organization was a part time ancillary function. Uh, in addition to teaching a full load of classes, that was the uh, that was a uh, a responsibility of somebody who was elected, and and that eventually changed as well. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we were full time teachers. This was mm -hmm. uh, something that that uh, there was no pay involved. Mm -hmm. 
Um, of course, that has changed since then. And this is one of the reasons when you asked me earlier if I was involved with, with students, you know, in terms of clubs and sure. as an advisor and that kind of thing. And uh, I'd have to say that I, I got caught up in the... Your energies in went the, elsewhere. Yeah, sure. to the Teachers Association. Primarily, of course, we all were chaperones sure. of events in those days, you know, the dances and, and the ball games and that kind of thing. Dave, why did you go into education? What made, what was the... Uh, what was the reason for you deciding to pursue a career in education to begin with? Now, John, you know, it's, it's interesting in that I started off to be an engineer in college. Okay. And uh, I got involved with a fraternity, uh, one of the Greek fraternities, Alpha Sigma Phi was mm -hmm. the, the national. And uh, I had some opportunities there. I became pledge master and I organized a, a teaching program and Worked with the university, gave us a classroom, you know, to learn history and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that was my first kind of ah, exposure to this kind of a thing. Okay. And uh, I enjoyed that. And I had always uh, uh, had that as a secondary type of uh, uh, desire. Ah, uh, my okay. family my, uh, had teachers in its, its history and its they background. Did. Uh -huh. And my aunts were uh, uh -huh. normal school graduates. I and they, they were teachers of the elementary school back in the old days. And uh, so there was, I guess, part of that exposure. Uh, when I talked about changing into education, I got good support from my parents. Yes. My, I found out then, much, much later, that my father at one time had thought about that. He was a businessman. Uh, had thought about going into teaching, but he worked and helped his yeah. sisters through college as his father had died. And, uh, he became the, the, the head of the family, so to speak. Yet more so, proof for the, for the old adage that the fantasies of the father become the realities of the son. Possibility. You know? yeah. So I got good encouragement from my parents there. And uh, uh, I had opportunities, several business opportunities, right when I, one when I was in graduate school. And then right after I had been in Brentwood a couple of years, both of which I said, no, no, this is this is my life. This is where I want to be. This interaction with kids and and, and your, your ability perhaps to uh, to shape something, uh, to help them learn, to help. No, I don't mean just the academic of aspect of it, the character of development. Uh, and the interaction with your colleagues, the growth that took place there. I well, the people who worked with you. Exciting. The people who worked with you both uh, in the classroom and uh, and also as an administrator knew you to be uh, a very compassionate person too that that was one of the qualities that you brought all the way along with you uh, for as long as you were involved in education who were the people who the adults that it, that you think had the most influence on you when you were a youngster you know as a child mm. well i think without without a doubt it, it wasn't my Unfortunately, it wasn't my teacher's. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. You know, right. I was a product of uh, 12 years of Catholic education. Uh -huh. Okay. Eight years of nuns oh. and four years of the brothers. Oh, boy. And uh, those were the days. Oh, and they were tough. Yeah. Those they were, were tough days. disciplinarians. Oh, for sure. Uh, Had a taste uh, of that and, myself. And some, some very good teachers yes. uh, among them. But... Uh, uh, Heavy on the discipline end of things. Mm -hmm. The people that influenced, I'd say my father was, uh, was a big influence in, on my life. Mm -hmm. because I always viewed him as a, uh, as you said before, you know, about compassion. He was a very ethical, compassionate man. Uh, a, a very strong person. Yes. Though. Very strong, uh, head of his family. Yeah, sometimes Not only, people uh, confuse uh, compassion with weakness, and there's, there's, there's no way that the two are can. Oh no! Are the same thing. Right? No, you can be compassionate and strong. My father mm -hmm. was that way. I mean, he was not that he uh, wasn't a disciplinarian because he was. Yeah. He was a very understanding man, very supportive. He was always there for you, and he was a good model. Of course, we all had heroes in those days that were different. Uh, you know, in terms of what was, heroes we have. Who, what now. heroes do you remember? <laughs> what heroes do you remember? Well, remember? you know, when you when you're a kid, there were, yeah. of course, your your heroes were comic book characters okay. of, right. of Superman and <laughs> Batman and that type. But, uh, as I got older, I guess one of the, one of the, my heroes, uh, and still to this day, yeah. uh, would probably be the character found in Cyrano de Bergerac of all people. Yes. Yes. Uh, because of his 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 courage. Yeah. Uh, but 
and I think that was a good model too. Tell me about uh, tell me about your favorite subjects in school when you were a student. Do you remember? You said you were intending on pursuing engineering at first uh, when you got to college. Uh, you must. My assumption is that you must have enjoyed uh, the mathematics and the science when you were when you were a student. You just following that yeah. science and math. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, although I'd have to say that when I was in high school, chemistry certainly wasn't my favorite subject. Mm -hmm. Algebra, probably. Mm -hmm. um, biology. So when I did switch from engineering into education, uh, I had the science background, and uh, I went on and did my graduate work in genetics. So when I came into Brentwood, I was a, a pretty well-equipped um, science teacher in terms of Bio, the biological sciences and the chemistries, because you have to have the chemistries in, in terms of your biochemistry and genetics and that. And uh, they were kind of my favorite subjects, I guess. I'm, I'm the uh, oldest. Oh, English, John. I, oh, you, yes? Uh, well, I had a minor in English. Oh, you did? I, I enjoyed uh, uh, Shakespeare. I have to say that. What didn't uh, you excellent like? Excellent. What didn't you like? <laughs> Was there a subject you didn't like? Do you remember one? Oh yeah, analytical geometry. Is that okay? Oh, I hated that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, for some reason, could not get through physics. I took it three times. I kept trying. I kept trying. I kept trying, and I enjoyed it, but I couldn't pass it. It just didn't click for me, and so that's why I can. I ask. I, generally, there's something that uh, that we that we struggle with, that we wrestle with when we're. Well, I'll tell you, uh, and it's kind of sad in in, in a respect of the profession that I went into. But the most boring courses were the educational courses. Yes. I think yes. in those days, yes. uh, the education departments in colleges really weren't preparing teachers the yeah. way that they should be. Most of us know. came uh, onto the job ill-prepared. We learned on the job. We learned from mm -hmm. our colleagues. And that's the beauty of the change that has taken place because now you have a lot of support for teachers, new teachers out on the uh, on the job for the first year or so. There's your, your, your unions have, uh, through cooperation with administration in the state, have teacher centers now that will give them support. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the concept of, uh, of teacher buddies, of, yes. of colleagues mentoring. helping colleagues, right. mm -hmm. the mentoring that you're talking about. All of that, I think, uh, have been important gains. Plus, the, the, the preparation of teachers uh, is better in the colleges. Uh, there's been a lot of research on how kids learn, how uh, different kinds of approaches are more effective than exactly, others, sure. which we're just starting to, to come about in, in, let's say, the late, well, we're not even the late 60s, in the early 70s, we started to see some good breakthroughs in, in that respect. More support, better preparation uh, in terms of techniques, uh, and, and I think that that will help bring about a more professional self-determination on the part of the teaching staff. I, want, I hope you don't mind if I, if I just take it back for a little uh, bit to ask you a question about um, when you were growing up. Uh, I mentioned this because I was the oldest in my family. And as I've talked to people uh, among my siblings, I, I talked to people um, who were the oldest um, we seem to have things in common. Where, where were you in the birth order of your your siblings? By the way, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have one brother, one sister. One brother. Okay, we're. Uh, I'm the middle man. You're in the middle. Okay. All right. I'm always in the middle. I was in the middle management. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Well, that 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 uh, may or may not follow whether there's any connection there, but. Uh, well, my brother was the oldest. He's yes. four and a half years older than myself. My sister is four and a half years younger than me. But I think there's a, I think there's a lot of ham in the Marts family. It, but also, there's a lot of closeness in the family too. You oh, yeah, have close you communication. Had very, very close to one another. Of course, um, uh, distance has separated us. Well, uh, I wasn't referring to that when I said closeness. I know that we do keep in, mm -hmm. in close communication. My brother went off in uh, uh, in the sixties to California. He was a graduate of Carnegie Tech, mm -hmm. uh, which is now Carnegie Mellon, which had uh, a very highly respected, and still to this day, one of the most highly respected schools of drama. And he studied 
drama at Carnegie Tech, and he went on to become a TV actor and director. Uh, and I guess maybe that kind of acting and being a ham runs in the family. I think every yeah. everybody in our profession <laughs> are actors and hams because we get up and perform, perform in, the sense, oh, in, a, sure. in the classroom. Oh, sure. And uh, so I guess I used to say five shows a day, or five days a week. Yeah, that's right. lots of times we look at our watch, we read <laughs> that's it, right. we're having lunch, and say, "Oh, in ten minutes, I'm on." <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> yes, there have been uh, many changes in this community, in this school district, uh, in the time that we have seen uh, a good deal of growth take place. Some of that growth has been very positive, and some of it has been not so positive. Uh, but of all the changes that you have seen take place during your tenure as an educator, uh, what do you think was the one thing that that uh, is the most significant in Brentwood? From what point of view, John? Well, it's an open-ended question. Uh, I, I purposely didn't. Uh, I guess, yeah, for you. I left it open because I want you to be able to answer from any perspective that you're comfortable answering. Uh, from the point of view of, uh, I guess, uh, you could look at, at the community of Brentwood. What's the biggest change to take place? Well, there's a lot of changes in the community. Well, of course, we went through the rapid growth period in yes. Brentwood. Um, when I first came to Brentwood, we were, and I, I think it was one of the big positive aspects of Brentwood. Brentwood primarily was a working class community. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a lot of people that came out the Allen from out of the city, out of uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn, yep. the Bronx and Queens, because they wanted backyards and grass for kids. Uh, Brentwood all, also had been an established community, uh, oh, very small and going way back. Uh, and it was close to two... Uh, mental hospitals, so there was employment in the area for people uh, over at Pilgrim State and Central Islip. Uh, very little industry on the That's house, right. so a great deal of the, the people in Brentwood, if you didn't work locally, you commuted into the back and forth of the city. I can remember the Chamber of Commerce and trying very hard to encourage industry to come to Brentwood. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a good ethnic mix, which yeah. you didn't find in districts, which was not part of my background and experience. When I came to Brentwood, uh, I had very little exposure to minorities. Mm -hmm. And there was a good mix in Brentwood at that time. Uh, and that is part of Brentwood of what has changed. It, it blossomed and it grew, and it, it changed in terms of uh, the character of its student body and, and its character of its, uh, its population. And uh, it, the minority groups, the Hispanic uh, groups brought their families over. It was a, almost a, a typical historical template Revolution, sure. of how uh, uh, immigration comes into this country and establishes itself. How the country has evolved, and, yeah. And right. how the country involved itself. So we it used to say that. it's a microcosm of the whole, right. of the whole country. A good you know? catch. I, yeah. And the thing that impressed me uh, was it was an opportunity to to grow with the district. I lived in Brentwood, still living in Brentwood for that matter. My kids went to the Brentwood school. How many children do you have there? I have uh, three children, mm -hmm. two daughters and a son. Mm -hmm. They went through the Brentwood public schools. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter uh, lives in Islip, as I've indicated before, I have uh, three grandchildren that are just yes. nearby. So my kids were exposed to a good ethnic mix mm -hmm. and they had the opportunities to, to uh, uh, to work with all kinds of individuals and kids, where when I was a youngster growing up, I w it was more a lily white type of uh, uh, school experience. And it was a good experience for my children, a good experience for me. And of course, Brentwood has changed over the years uh, where the, uh, the, there's been larger uh, number of minorities in the, coming into the district, sure. uh, as we said before, it's the microchasm. That's, That's one right. of the biggest changes that, have, that yeah. have taken place in the district. Uh, it's now, it's gone through its growth stages. Uh, it, it, had, it went through a stage of declining population. That's right, sure. Now it's going through a stage of increasing population. We're now getting, our schools are getting back to being crowded again. We went through those periods of times where we were on sports session for years, as you, as you sure. were aware. Sure, I remember morning session, 
afternoon session, overlap session, mm -hmm. and then an evening session. So that school was open from seven in the morning till 11 at night. Oh, there was a period of time, John. You remember here at the high school where we had the 10th graders in the, uh, in the afternoon, we had our 11th and, and uh, 12th grade in the morning session. We went from 7 o'clock in the morning till 6.30 at night. We had two uh, sets of administrators, some overlapping both sessions. Uh, we, we had teachers that overlapped both sessions or primarily worked in one or the other. I mean, there, there were some, some trying times there. You, you just provoked a question which uh, uh, I, I must ask. There is this feeling on the part of some teachers that when a, when a colleague moves into an administrative position, they forget all about what it was like to be a teacher. <laughs> and there is also the view that um, teachers and administrators see the world from very, very different perspectives, which makes it very difficult not only to communicate sometimes, but also uh, to... Um, um, to make to make a decision on on a given issue, when you can see both sides of the issue, if in fact you can see both sides of the issue, you had to make uh, you you faced a great many problems once you had made the transition to an administrative position. First part of the question: Did you ever forget what it was like? And secondly, what was the most difficult? Uh, category of problems that you had to deal with as an, as an administrator? Well, I think when I first became an administrator, I'd come off a role of teacher leadership, and I built trust with my colleagues, and then all of a sudden I'm an administrator. And it wasn't very long after being a department head of science that and, and Within a year, I was an assistant principal. Uh -huh. uh, not that it was something that I was seeing, as I'd indicated before. That we were under rapid growth. The positions were there. They were tapping people who had, yes. had ex leadership experience. And I was thrust in, into the situation of being the enemy. Yes. And I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. And you weren't the enemy, really. And I didn't see myself as the enemy, no. to be honest with you. Right. Exactly. Uh, but... There was a different perspective here now mm -hmm. as an administrator, mm -hmm. and uh, we had just gone through that that growth period where we were still in a situation where there wasn't trust between administration and the teachers. Yeah, and here I was on the other side, so to speak, mm -hmm. and so I, it was a strange feeling to be okay. not trusted. Imagine. So it was you had to win that over again. Yeah, it was like starting uh, okay. to work with your staff so that. that not be the enemy, not to fight over little stupid things, but to work together as a, a building administration on that level with its staff. That is and, fundamental then, isn't it? I mean, well, the, the trust is yeah, fundamental. You, you have to have the trust. Of course, now we've evolved, I think, where mm -hmm. there is uh, uh, more cooperation. We are working together to accomplish the same goals. We start to see that, hey, we're, we're, we're both on the yes. same side of these things. But that, that transition period was very difficult. And the toughest, I think, decisions to make are when you're thrust in a situation of evaluation and there has to be a recommendation, uh, and that recommendation comes from many quarters. It could start as a department head. Uh, we had line administrative department heads that were also teachers, and that's why I love that job because it was the best of both worlds. You could inf influence your colleagues as an administrator, and yet you were still in the classroom. So you, you didn't forget. Yes. And I went through that transition period of still having the one foot in the classroom yes. and one foot in an administration. Yes. So I didn't forget that. Never, Never do you forget that aspect. But you do get kind of tied up with the administrative stuff, and sometimes you forget what your job is all about. And you got to pull yourself back and say, hey, that the purpose is of an administrator is to fa facilitate. Yes. Yeah the teacher to do his job because that is what it's all about, is for kids to learn. And the people that are doing that job are the teachers in the classroom. Of course, it's supported by other kinds of activities which administration may facilitate also, but it, primarily the administrator's job is to help teachers do their job. To deliver. That's what yeah. it's all about. Yeah. To, to help provide the safe environment for yes. the kids, right? Yes. 
to help teachers with their problems in bringing about the education of the kids. I mean, that sounds very administratively philosophic, but that, that's really where it no, but that, The hardest decisions are when you have to make a recommendation of whether you hire or fire. Hiring is easy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's easy to do. Yes. Good hiring, of course, is difficult. Yes. And that, of course, is one of the secrets to successful school districts. You hire good people, mm. you know, and you keep good people, and you do whatever you have to do to keep good people, and you're going to have a good school. There, and that's key. But there, when you don't have, when you have an individual who, let's say, you have to make a recommendation that they work somewhere else, right. that's the toughest one to make. That's you, life and death. Sam Weitzman, you know, I mentioned that yes, name you before, uh, an old union man. When I became a uh, department head, he'd point his finger at me and say, he'd say, David, you're a bastard. <laughs> He's the only man I'd allow. He could publicly <laughs> call me a bastard. Because I, I knew what, what he meant when he said that. Sam had a philosophy. He said, anybody that can control the firing of someone, that has input on that, that's in that kind of a situation, is a bastard by the nature of his job, not by the nature of his personality. Mm -hmm. So I understood Sam. Okay. And of course, that is a tough thing to do. And you're also, you're in a role sometimes where you have to make some difficult to, uh, decisions concerning some kids. Do you think that... Do you and that's tough too, John, by Oh, way. for when, sure. You know, I was in a role where you'd have to make a recommendation to your superintendent of schools to have someone expelled. Yes. Right? And it was necessary for the health of your school. You it's never good for the kid. No. And, it, and it's anguish. Those... Two areas, I think, hurt the most, the cut to the soul. Yeah. And yet, you know, you have to do it. You know, it's the right thing to do. There, there were some individuals that, as students, didn't belong in a school because they really weren't students. Yes. And I'm not going to name names, but that's history, yeah. and we don't yeah. want to go into no, no, that no, here. No, no, of course not. But that always gave me a lot of sleepless nights yeah. when, when that happened. When you had to expel someone, or you had someone that just and absolutely that's the part of the there. job that you certainly don't miss. No, that part. No, that part of the job. You know, you miss the colleagues. Yeah. You miss the interaction with your adult friends, and you miss the interaction with the kids because kids are so vital and so full of energy. They're, they refresh you all yeah. the time. I walked around here in the hall uh, today before you arrived, and I was looking at the kids, and you know that that. Kind of warm feeling came back to me. Again. I've heard yeah. I heard someone say recently that oh John you don't know kids have changed in the last ten years mm -hmm. and I said I don't believe that I think kids don't change their behavior may change but kids are kids kids have always been kids kids will always be kids I don't know if you agree with that but I think that that uh, perhaps the times and I don't miss having to deal with some of the behaviors that uh, we hear about now that we're no longer here. Um, that creates the pain for for the oh, educator. Of course, of course. Yeah. You have pretty much described, I think, uh, your philosophy of education by the answers that uh, that you've given. If you had it all, if you had it to do all over again, did you make the right decision? Oh yeah. 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 yeah I think from a fulfilling point of view. Yeah. Of course, we'd all like to have made decisions that made us you bet. rich people, but that, would we? Would well, we? but that that that's not fulfilling yeah. in its own its yeah. own right. Yeah. Uh, I think thanks to uh, thanks to the, the to the dynamism of the of uh, the organization and the union movement and the professionalism of that uh, organization that you certainly had large input into, teachers are a lot well off better. They're a lot well off today, well, better well off today financially oh, yeah. than they were uh, when we began teaching. John, when uh, when you and I started, it was tough to raise a family on a teacher's income. That's it. And Virtually you, impossible if you depended only on your teaching income. Well, most of us uh, had to either take secondary jobs. That's right, yes. In the profession or uh, part-time jobs out of the profession. Now, I taught night school and summer school the first couple of years that I was in Brentwood. So I worked, in a sense, around the clock. Mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the school year, through the summers, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. two nights a week type of situation to bring in that income. You know, you were, you were struggling to put 
food on the table to, yeah, and to have a home. It was the dream to have a, to have a house, to have a new car, to have your kids clothed and, and fed and have good education, have good recreation, those kinds of things. And we were able to do that, but it, it, it was a struggle. And as time went on, uh, the comparative uh, salaries of teachers, let's say, versus engineering uh, or other professionals uh, got closer together. Yes. And finally we reached a situation where, uh, in, in my mind, I think that uh, the compensation for teachers is, is more fair in, in terms of their contribution to society. And, and uh, it provides them a, a better lifestyle, which they are entitled to. Uh, and I think that's a big improvement. And they've become recognized uh, as professional people that deserve the support of their community. And I'd say one thing about Brentwood even though I know Brentwood has some difficulty and I live here in terms of the high tax rate and so forth and getting budgets yeah. through. But over the years, they have been very supportive for the teachers. Absolutely. Back, historically, if you go back to when Charlie Gray was president in the early 60s, we ran a campaign and uh, I was very much in, involved as the chairman of the committee that set this uh, campaign up in which we went to the taxpayers and asked them to come. In those days, you voted at an annual meeting in uh, some hall somewhere, usually in the auditorium of your school. In this case, it was in the Sonderling Auditorium. Mm -hmm. We had a commitment from the Board of Education by Ed Sonderling, who was president of the board, who said, if the community will vote to increase their taxes and give you a bigger raise, and they had given us 100 and we wanted uh, four, I think, and ended up with three, something like that. I mean, it wasn't mm -hmm. some large amount of money that, that was con, uh, yes. in contention here. And we set up telephone, uh, uh, four or five telephones in Marion Gray's house. And we had teacher volunteers that called uh, all throughout the community over a, a two week period to get, get them out for this uh, meeting in the auditorium. And the community came in and <laughs> voted an amendment to the budget to give the teachers a raise along with the other staff members, the secretarial and custodians, because the Board of Education says if one party gets something, then the rest of the people get, get the benefit of it. That was Ed Sonderland. Okay. And uh, we had 600 and some people come into that auditorium that night. We had taxi service. We had babysit service. I mean, we were well organized. Great. And that Great memory. community turned out and supported its yes. teachers, yeah. giving itself higher taxes and a raise because we wanted to keep good, good staff. Yeah. And they recognized that and gave us support. And I think that was unique in Brentwood, too. So they've been supportive, not always in terms of their budgets. And that's really not their fault as much as it is the way education is funded. And Correct. I of course, we all know Brentwood has a difficult time with that. There is an enormous turnover taking place again now at the high school and at all throughout the district because of the people who are retiring. Retirements. And yes. uh, new people coming in to a teacher just beginning their career now in the 90s. Is there a piece of advice that you might offer them in terms of uh, their direction? Of course, that's not, not an easy thing because we all like to give advice, of course. But I, I think there are a couple key things that the teachers have to, new people coming in have to realize that you always have to work at your craft. It doesn't stop. You never stop. You always hone your craft. And you, you work with, with the kids. And you, you, you have to find the best way to reach your students. And some are going to be more difficult than others. And of course, you're not going to have all the skills to reach all the kids all the time. But you have to work at that. And you have to work at your techniques. And always every day, keep it fresh, yeah. keep it alive. Uh, that's that's the important point. Good advice. And, and there's, in terms of education, it should be an ongoing thing. There's workshops, there's the center. Yes. Go to these things, talk with your colleagues, share yeah. ideas. And a lot of this comes about in, in departments, in department sure meetings. And I think that, if anything, is the advice and, and have patience. And of course, it goes without, without saying mm. that you, you're, you're going to be you're going to be fair. Be known as a fair person to work with kids. That doesn't mean that uh, 
that you don't have structure, that your classroom isn't structured. Some people work in different kinds of atmosphere. You got to find your how it fits your personality and work at that. Being involved with the with the organization was a, a, a good path for you to go. Would you suggest that for somebody starting today after a couple of years? You think? Um, or is that something that individuals uh, pretty much have to determine as they as they go along? Because it's different today in many respects. A lot of the work has been done. A lot of the uh, a lot of the organization is there. Uh, we're, it's we're starting from a different place now. It's a different age. Education is to some degree in a different place than it was thirty years ago. Well, and, and, and how you relate to your organization is different too. But there's still that that. Historically, in common need, one I think uh, it's imperative that that you do support your organization. I think it's imperative that uh, that you stay up to date with them. I don't know that you have to to be involved as an officer. That, that's the individual yes. thing that, that comes okay. about. I think you, you you should be involved somewhere along the line, not just not one that. Because, you know, the okay. teaching profession is something that uh, is not just the classroom. It, it extends itself out of that. And so many classroom teachers are involved in as coaches and as advisors. Yes. And, uh, I think you're right, Dave. And I think, too, very often it reflects back on the culture, the political culture, too. Um, part of uh, what makes a democracy work is participation and, and uh, awareness and involvement. And to the degree that people don't participate, uh, to that degree we begin to lose whatever we've accomplished. So I think what you say holds true. Two questions, and, uh, and I'll thank you and, and let you go. I know how you are remembered because uh, I know you, and I know people who know you. I also was present at your retirement dinner, and I, and I heard what was said, and I saw what took place. So I know how you're remembered. But how would you like to be remembered? Well, of course, we all want to be remembered well. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> you bet. But I think maybe that, that probably I want to be remembered as somebody who, who accomplished something yeah. uh, in terms of the growth of my profession, in, in terms of the impact that I had on my colleagues, positive impact, I hope. Uh, and the impact that I had in terms of my philosophy towards the students, the kids. Uh, hopefully, I've, I've made some inroads there. Uh, certainly, uh, when I look back over my career, I, I feel pretty good about. That's a wonderful thing to be able accomplishments. To say. You know, you I, uh, we all think that we a lot of things we could have done better. Mm. And certainly like we would like to have seen that. Perhaps I should have taken a, a different route at different times in my career, but I don't regret the decisions the that I did make. I don't regret that at all. I, I certainly enjoyed uh, the roles that I had in the profession as a teacher, as a department head, teaching administrator, as an assistant, as a building principal. And I enjoyed the roles of leadership in the organizations. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Right. In your interviews of prospective candidates uh, along your tenure, I'm sure you had many opportunities to ask this question. Now I'm going to ask it of you. Is there anything that you would like to have answered or any question that you would like to have been asked that wasn't asked that you would like to answer now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think maybe I've been asked that question. <laughs> oh, have you? Okay. I don't know whether Fred Weaver ever asked me that or not. Somewhere along the line, I, you, in an interview, you say, well, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. No, I can't, I can't say anything. I know, John, I hope that, that, that somewhere along the line, that, that what we're doing here today means something to somebody. And I'm sure it will. And I'm sure in, with the passage of even more time, it'll be more valuable and more appreciated by those who have a chance to participate with us in, in watching these moments. David, thank you so much. John, thank you for asking me here. I enjoyed it.